All right, so again, high to low. Naturally, molecules are going to move. Doesn't expend a little bit of energy, but not much. But when it goes from low concentration to high, then it's going to need some assistance and an input of energy. When we're looking at the cell membrane, what we're going to find is that high to low is, and we'll um, see some simple kinds of proteins. When it goes from low to high, you need a little bit more complex proteins because not only in the channel or the pore, when it holds on to something in low concentration and it wants to push it into an area of high concentration, not only do you have a binding spot for the molecule that's being transported, but also you have a second binding spot for the input of some kind of energy source. Because like, think about if you go into a room, so I walk into a room and it's empty, I can just freely get to my desk. But if you walk into a room and there's 200 people in here and you've got to get to that back corner, it takes you energy, right, to get through all those people and try and navigate your way. So when you have a molecular compound that's got to be pushed into an area that already has a high concentration of it, it's going to take you some energy to get it in there. You've got to really shove it in there. So you need an input of energy. Is this the real one? No, it's not. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's apply what we just learned. The fastest rate of diffusion will occur with which of these elements? So based on those four principles that we just talked about, think about which one applies to this. Yes, good. So what you're looking at is you're looking at which one of these is smaller. So thinking about which one is smaller, of all of these choices, the hydrogen is the smallest atom here. And that's why hydrogen is correct. So plasma membranes are what we call selectively permeable. They don't allow just anything in or out, which is great because what if you have a bacterium or a virus or poison outside of your cells. Because of the ability to select what goes in or out makes it a lot safer for our cells. Not always, but it does add some layer of protection. So as I mentioned, certain things like hydrogen ions are very, very small. They can just pass through. Hydrogen because it's so small and it can be an ion where it can give away electrons, it's used a lot in a lot of different chemical reactions within our cells. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so that one can just like, again, slip through the phospholipid bilayer, for example. Water, carbon dioxide, oxygen. These are things that can permeate or slip through the membrane without having any cost of energy. So let's talk about passive transport. When we're talking about something that's passive, it means that it's not using any energy. It's not using any assistance. It's low stakes in terms of energy and in terms of movement across the membrane. This is what we call going down a concentration gradient. I like to think of it like a slide. If you're at the top of the slide already, it's real easy to just like a little push and there you go. And it doesn't take much energy to go down the slide. Or if you're hiking, going up the mountain takes a lot more energy than walking down the mountain. So going down the concentration gradient, going from high to low, going down the mountain, going down the slide, Energy is not required. I mean, energy is always required, but we're generalizing a little tiny bit of energy. But in comparison to going up the mountain or climbing up the slide, that takes energy to do that. So we utilize, oh wait, let me talk about, okay, so opposite that, when energy is required, it's because you're going against the concentration gradient. You can also think about like pushing into a crowded room. 
You're going from low to high. You're going up the mountain, takes energy. You're going up the slide. You gotta climb up, that takes energy. You can think of like a big giant water slide that's like 10 stories high. All right, you get up there, you're like, whoo, I can just slide down. That's your passive transport. But you gotta walk up those 10 flights of stairs, right? And so that takes energy to get up there. So when we have energy requiring transport, you're going against the concentration gradient. You're going from a low concentration to high concentration. I mean, think about it. If the cell already has a ton of something, does it need more? In some cases it does, but you're gonna to have to push into a crowded area. You're gonna to have to expend energy to do that. So we're gonna take a look at these two categories of passive versus energy requiring transport and see what's needed in both situations. So let's start back with types of passive transport. We have what's called simple diffusion. Water. The diffusion of water, because water is so very important to making and breaking molecules, that kind of diffusion gets its own special name called osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water from high concentration to low concentration, down the concentration gradient. All of these, when we're going to talk about all of these, again, are High concentration to low concentration, no energy required, easier, easier. Dissolved gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen, as I mentioned, they're small. They're very, very, very tiny. So they can just slip on through. Or if you're something that can dissolve into lipids, then the lipid bilayer, which is typically like a guard or a wall against anything coming in or out, if you can like get with it, dissolve into it, you can just slip right on through without it blocking you. So if you're lipid soluble. All of these, when we're talking about simple diffusion, you don't need any protein. You can just get through the phospholipids, which is very unusual because most molecules or compounds are going to need the assistance of a protein. So this is like, very, very easy. You're very, very tiny, like water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, or you can dissolve into a lipid. You can just slip right through the lipid because you can dissolve into it. So you don't need any help from a protein. No help needed, no assistance. Okay, so here you can see like oxygen. And again, this could be, this little red thing could be oxygen. It could be hydrogen ion, it could be carbon dioxide, water, or something that can dissolve, and maybe another lipid can dissolve right through. So it just moves through, just slips right between those phospholipids. All right, let's talk a little bit about, os about osmosis. Osmosis, again, it's just the diffusion of water. Water, so, so, so important. Helps to make and break molecules. That's why hydration is so important to our cells. And water being so small of a compound just can slip right through phospholipid bilayer, which is so great because then we don't have to expend any energy for water to get in and out of our cells. That's really important. It is passive transport, all of these that I'm talking about are passive transport. So by principle, they go from high concentration to low concentration, down the concentration gradient, nice and easy, no energy is required. There's also another form of assistance for water, which are called aquaporins. And these are additional ways that we can ensure that water can get in and out. So again, water, super duper important, so we could use either, and you can see in this illustration that water can go in between the phospholipids or it can also slip through this channel here called an aquaporin. 
emphasizing water, so important to make sure that it always has a flow in or out of the cell. All right, let's talk a little bit about tonicity. Tonicity is the strength of a solution in relationship to water, osmosis. This gives us a setup of tonicity, that we're looking at the strength of sugar solution, syrup, in relationship to the water that's inside and outside. Key principle, water follows solute. So if you remember that the water is going to follow the solute, that you're going to have a large amount of water going toward the 75% solute, you're still gonna have water going toward the solute, but it's gonna be a smaller concentration of water. You're going to look at this in three different kinds of blood cells, well, same kind of blood cells, three different solutions we're going to put around the blood cells. We're going to put isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions around our blood cells. And then you're gonna see what, what is the effect of the blood cell? What's going to happen to it? All right, so let's talk a little bit about each of these situations. So isotonic, iso means equal. Iso equal. In our isotonic solution, we have an equal amount of solute inside and outside the cell, so you will have an equal movement of water into and out of the cell. So here's an isotonic solution. 50% solute inside the cell, 50% water. Outside the cell, 50% solute, 50% water. So what's gonna happen here is your water's gonna follow the solute into the cell, your water's gonna follow the solute outside of the cell. Because our solute is equal on both sides, the amount of water that goes in will equal the amount of water that goes out. So that's isotonic, iso meaning equal. Hypertonic. Okay, this one is harder to think about in terms of like the definition is the solute concentration of one solution is greater than the other. Well, what we're we talking about is greater inside or outside of the cell. Hypertonic means shrinking, hyper, shrink smaller. Maybe you can think like somebody who's hyper has a lot of energy because they're always like jittering and moving. In some cases people who are um, hyper might be very thin because they're always expending a lot of energy like bouncing and moving. So you can think of like hyper, smaller, shrinking. So here we're looking at the same kind of cell, that this one's gonna be smaller because outside the cell, That if we have a situation set up where inside of our cell, 
we've got 20% solute and 80% water, but outside our cell we have the opposite situation. water moving in and out of the cell. There's always going to be a movement of water, but you're going to have a lot more water moving out of the cell toward the greater amount of solute. percent of solute equals more water loss. More water is leaving toward the greater amount of solute, which means your cell here shrinks. And because we do have a little bit of solute in the cell, you get a little bit of water going in, but you'll get a greater percentage going out. So your cell is shrinking up. You will see in this case, when you look at the red blood cells, if you kind of remember last week, you looked at blood cells and the majority of those blood cells, which were pink, little pink circles all over, um, in their natural state, you just saw these nice little pink, a ton of pink round circles. What you're going to see today is when you put a hypertonic solution on the blood, that your blood cells are going to start to, and, and what this jagged edges mean is that the plasma membrane is starting to come in on the cell. It's folding in. So you get these points or folds all over the surface of the blood cell. So they look like, they're going to look like that. They're going to look spiky. Now, let's say that we put a solution where you have... If we have a solution where we put, or we have more solute inside and less outside, you're gonna get a lot more water going in. So your cell is going to swell. And that's what we call hypotonic. Hypotonic means the cell has more solute on the outside environment, and that cell is going to start to swell up with water. One said that the way they think about it was like hypos, like hippo, hypo, hippo, that hippos are big and fat, so your cell gets big and fat. The hyper one shrinks because they're like hyper, have a lot of energy, they get smaller. Whatever, whatever works. So in on your slide today, what you're going to take a look at when you put a hypotonic solution on blood, you're gonna see that your cells have a nice smooth outsides, but they're a lot bigger than the isotonic cells. You will also see less density as you let this hypotonic solution be on your blood. Over time, what's going to happen is that because the plasma membrane is pliable, because we don't have cell walls in our cells, a cell wall would allow it to like bulk up and it would be big and swollen, but it wouldn't pop 
because of the structure of the cell wall, but because we have a plasma membrane, it's like a balloon where you can blow up a balloon to some extent and then you put too much air in the balloon and what does it do? It pops. So these, what you may see, if you let this sit for 10 minutes, you will see hardly any cells left because they will pop. If you watch this, if you stick your hyposolu hypotonic solution on and you watch under the microscope, you can start to see cells popping. You can physically see them. So again, side by side, this is in an isotonic solution, a very normal, yes, yeah, Is that what happens when people have bad contributions to water? Or is that what happens? Like, have you ever heard of like the marathon runners that have bad contributions, excessive amount of water? Yes, and I'm not sure if that's the application here, but that's a good, very good question. Yeah. I know it's hy hyperhidrosis, right? It's called I think it's called hyperhidrosis. Um, that I'm, I, I think that's a good hypothesis, right? That too much water in your body is going in and because you have more solute inside your cells than outside your cells. I have to look it up. Yeah, good, good application. So an isotonic, it's a normal display of what your cell, your red blood cells will look like. When you put a hypertonic solution outside, you have a higher concentration of solute. We're gonna have more like salt, for example, and the water's gonna to go toward the salt, the higher concentration of the salt, so the cell is going to shrink. And then in this case, we're gonna put a very low concentration of salt around the cells, so there's a higher concentration of salt inside the cells, so the water's gonna go in. Let's continue on with other types of passive transport. Again, passive transport. High concentration to low concentration, going down the concentration gradient, no energy expended. The second time is called facilitated diffusion. A facilitator is a helper. So this is helped or aided by specific group of proteins called transport proteins. So when you think facilitated diffusion, if you're like, oh, what kind is that? And they just think facilitate means help, that the molecules or compounds that are going across the membrane need the help of a protein. They need to be facilitated or helped by something to get in and out of the cell. So we're going to look at two. As we talk about the two of them, the channel and carrier proteins, we're going to go from simple to more complex. So here's a channel protein. We talked a little bit about these earlier on. That a channel protein, what we see happening is that each of these channels, the size of the channel depends on the molecule to be transported. The larger the molecule to be transported, the larger the size of the pore, the larger the size of this channel protein. One thing that I want you to notice now in this illustration that I didn't point out last time was that we have a concentration gradient set up here that you have the molecules moving from high concentration to low concentration. So we do now, hopefully now you will recognize concentration gradient high to low going down the concentration gradient, no energy needs to be expended here. When we're talking about a carrier protein, when you have to carry something, you have to grab it, right? I'm gonna carry my water bottle. I can't just be like, ooh, ooh, water bottle, right? I've got to grab onto it and carry it. So when we're talking about a carrier transport protein, the molecule has to be grabbed onto. Again, concentration gradient set up here. High concentration of, we're talking about glucose. Typically when we're talking about carrier proteins, we're talking about larger compounds that need to be moved across. This is showing what this is indicating in the picture is that the protein is closed. This could not fit through here, this channel. So it's like this. And in the middle, it has in the middle, it's going to grab onto that. When this fits in here perfectly, like two pieces of a puzzle, 
you can see the shape of where it's grabbing onto the glucose is precisely shaped like the glucose. So if something else, and this is one of the great things about cells, is that there's so many molecules and compounds that are in our cells that something else could get in here. Like, let's just say it's a fructose. So a little bit different simple sugar gets in here, but fructose isn't precisely shaped like glucose. It's a little bit different. So even if a fructose just bounces in here and it's like, okay, come on, help me through, this protein is not going to respond because it's like, no, you don't fit perfectly with me. Go fructose, find your own carrier protein that works for you. So when the perfect molecule to the perfect fit of the shape of the protein gets in here, what's gonna happen, it's gonna go like, oh wait, oh, yep, you fit. It's going to change its shape by opening and then it goes back to being closed. So carrier grabs on, protein changes its shape from going to closed to open and it passes that through. Again, it is passive transport going from high concentration on one side to low concentration on the other, going down the concentration gradient. And this is another example that I showed you last time. We could have larger compounds like sugars, amino acids, um, smaller proteins that our carrier protein, the second kind of transport protein, it's going to be closed. When this fits in perfectly, stimulates the protein to change its shape by opening and then passes that through and it goes back to being closed. High concentration area to low concentration area. All right, let's think about this question. Two aqueous solutions, when I say aqueous, I mean water solutions, are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Water can move across, but starch cannot. So it's like the dialysis tubing, your sausages that you made, that the water could move back and forth, but the sugar couldn't. So in this case, the water can move, but the starch can't. Solution A is 10% starch, and solution B is 5% starch. What will occur after a few hours? So give this a read over, and then I'm going to draw this out. Maybe two. Yeah, let, let, let's see. Okay, so solution A. So solution A So let's imagine that what we have going on here is that we've got some kind of barrier between our 10% starch solution and our 5% starch solution. And let's just say this barrier in the context of a cell, that this is a cell membrane, that maybe, you know, like this is the inside of the cell and this is the outside of the cell. So water is going to follow solute from both sides. So if it's 10% starch, this one is 90% water and if this one's five percent starch it's 95 percent water so you are going to get water is going to follow the solute because there's 10 percent over here there's if we take the difference between these two you've got five percent difference or greater amount of solute over here.
So that just means that this is gonna get a little bit more water, 5% more water flow to solution A than B. So yes, whoever said two more, water will diffuse from B to A. Anybody any questions on that? All right, now let's shift. Let's go to types of transport across a membrane that need energy to do so. We're going to take a look at three different kinds. One is active transport and then endocytosis and exocytosis. So active transport, we're gonna use a protein here. We need the help of a protein to get this molecular compound across. Because we need energy, this protein is gonna be a bit bigger it's going to have the precise shape to transport that specific molecule or compound across. And then it's going to have another binding site. It's going to have two. So one for the molecule to transport and one for the energy source. The energy source is going to give the energy to the protein so that the protein can take this molecule and push it through. Well, why does it need energy? Remember that when we're talking about active transport, So when we're talking about active transport, just to remember, that an active transport or concentration gradient is gonna go from low concentration to high concentration. So you're pushing into a crowded room. You already have a ton of this molecule. It's very crowded in the cell, so you need some energy to push it through. you are going against the concentration gradient. It takes energy to go against it. You need energy to do this. pushing into a crowded room, you're climbing up the mountain. You need energy to do those things, whichever way you want to contextualize that in your brain. So that's why, again, there's two binding sites, one for the molecule to be transported, and then a second one to get energy to do this pushing into the crowded room or pushing against the concentration gradient. So, the energy, energy, energy. Typically, what we're gonna find is that one of the most utilized forms of energy in our cell is ATP. I mentioned this early on when we talked about biomolecules and talked about nucleic acids, that nucleic acid, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, they're made up of single nucleotides. Now, we have this whole within that kind of nucleic acid realm, you have some nucleotides that don't make chains and make nucleic acids. ATP is really important 
It's a universal energy molecule for our cells. It is the energy that is made in cellular respiration that when we utilize oxygen in our cells to break down our food or our energy inputs, we break down our food or energy into little tiny useful packets of energy, the nucleotide ATP. So we have a lot available. It's like the thing that we just pump, pump, pump out through cellular respiration to break down our food energy inputs into this very important little packet of energy, the nucleotide ATP. We're gonna talk a lot about that in the next few chapters, this unit actually. So that's gonna be the energy that is input most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when we're looking at active transport. So here's our picture. Let's take a look. We have a concentration gradient here that we have a high concentration of, they're seeing calcium ion. You have a high concentration of that calcium ion on this side. You have a low concentration on this side. For whatever reason, our cell needs more calcium. It's got a whole bunch, but it's gonna need more. So because it needs more, you have this particular kind of active transport protein. You can see it is closed here. It has a binding site. Imagine that binding site is perfectly shaped toward this calcium ion. That when this calcium ion is needed, it binds into there. Nothing will happen until an energy source comes and binds to the second binding site here. So this might be sitting, it might get in there and sit there, but until you have ATP, it's not going to change the shape of this particular protein and then push that calcium into an area of high concentration. So now you have the molecule to be transported, the calcium ion, you've got the ATP ready. ATP is going to break a bond. It's going to release energy. When it releases energy to this protein, it gives the protein the energy to open up its core and ugh, shove that calcium ion into an area of high concentration. It's gonna push it through. It needs energy to ugh, shove it in there. Then this is broken down. So it breaks down, and we'll talk about this next time, into its smaller parts. It's broken a bond here, given the energy. That's broken down. Molecule has been transported through, and the protein here goes to being closed again. All right, two other things that we need energy in the cell to do. Endocytosis, endo, this part of the word means into. Cytosis, movement into a cell, the movement of a cell. So we get movement into the cell through the membrane. Cells taking something in, emptying something in. This is a large process, much larger than we're talking about with our channel carrier for active transport proteins. This is big, something big is coming into the cell. Think about it as like glucose or any of the other complex sugars that you get from your food, a fat molecule, a protein, all of those things are gonna need some kind of bigger way to transport into the cell to get to the mitochondria so that cellular respiration can occur. So they're big. So here you have something. What happens is the cell utilizes, it makes a pocket out of phospholipids to make a vesicle. If you remember back from when we were talking about the different organelles of the cell, a vesicle is essentially, it's a way to transport something around the cell and it keeps it inside of a fat layer so that whatever it is isn't exposing the entire cell to that mass that's coming in. So cell membrane has to pinch off. It's going to take some extra energy to make extra phospholipids to allow for a vesicle to form around whatever's coming in. And then this can go to the mitochondria and go over there and then start to get broken down through the process of cellular respiration. So something's coming into the cell. All right, depends on what's coming into the cell. Pinocytosis means liquid 
or timing. That something liquid or really, really small is coming in. This is what it looks like. This is a picture of under an electron microscope showing that you've got these pockets of things. Look at how often this is happening. It's happening a lot. One of the many, many reasons why at rest, when you are sitting and you are kind of doing quote unquote nothing, right? If you're just sitting still, you're not doing nothing. These things are happening that require energy. You're breathing, right? You're still breathing as you're sitting there. You're breathing, your blood's still pumping. You have the movement of stuff through your digestive system. So something is always happening, whether we're talking about like large scale, like breathing, or at the cell level, something happening that we need energy to persist or keep going as an organism. So again, penocytosis. This is called phagocytosis. It's when something larger gets taken into the cell. So penocytosis, liquid or something small, phagocytosis is something larger. Our white blood cells do phagocytosis, specifically when a bacteria, a virus particle, something foreign enters your bloodstream. We have cells that say, no, no, no. Remember that you have those cell surface markers that are going to identify this is not part of our species, so let's flag this. And then you have these other white blood cells that come and they, they gobble up that bacteria, virus, fungus, whatever it is that doesn't belong. So an amoeba, which is a single organism, a smaller protist, you can see it's going to engulf this other organism. It starts to form a membrane around that thing to take it into its body. These are our white blood cells in action. Our white blood cells here are going to use different parts of their membrane to start engulfing all of these different bacteria. And again, just other organisms that do this. Here's another white blood cell. And here's another picture of an amoeba. All right, what happens when something has to go out of the cell? It has to exit. Exocytosis, exit. So if you're like, I can't remember what endo means, you certainly can remember exo, exit. So if something is going to leave the cell. It's the opposite process of endocytosis. So something's made in our cell, like maybe a waste product, put a vesicle around it, bring it to the cell membrane and then push it out. Could be a hormone, your cell makes a hormone and it's going to send that message hormone over to some other cell. So here you can see there's a vesicle that's formed around something, merges with the membrane of the cell, opens up and releases it. Could be released into the extracellular area where there's a blood vessel and then the blood vessel takes that thing in and transports it somewhere else, like a hormone. This could be hormones that are made and they go to the extracellular area and when they're released, they go from high concentration there to low concentration in a capillary into the blood and then that travels to the target cell and it says to another cell, hey, you do something, we're in a process of a chain of events that are going to happen. So what would happen if the plasma membrane were composed solely of phospholipids and no proteins? You gotta really think about this. So would all molecules across the membrane stop? Are there molecules and compounds that can get through the phospholipid bilayer without the assistance of proteins? Yes. Yeah, right? Okay, so this is not true because we said water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, small ions can slip through. So that is not true. 
simple diffusion and osmosis would continue to occur. Okay, so we know osmosis would continue to occur because osmosis can happen with an aquaporin or without. So that's true, but simple diffusion? Each. Does some of simple diffusion need a transport protein? Yes, so that is not true. Facilitated diffusion, yeah, we know that that's facilitated by a transport protein. Active transport, going against the concentration gradient, needs a protein. And osmosis would not occur. So that's true, true, and that is not true, right? Movement of molecules across the membrane would not be affected. Oh, sorry, would not occur. Oh, wait, shoot. It messes up. Simple diffusion. Sorry, going back to simple diffusion. Simple diffusion would occur. Yes. This makes this not true. That osmosis would still occur. I messed it up. Let's go. Let me um, let me go back to simple diffusion. Sorry about that. I messed you all up. Sorry, simple diffusion, just to, to reiterate my wrongness. Simple diffusion, no protein is needed. So simple diffusion and osmosis would continue to occur. Let me do this. Okay, so, excuse me, someone else get up here. So simple diffusion, no protein needed, and osmosis would continue to occur. This couldn't, this couldn't, but this could still occur, so that makes number three not true. And we know some things can still move across the membrane. So excuse me, I'm sorry. Number two is correct. I hope I didn't mess you all too, too much. Okay, let's talk about different connections between cells. So we have what are called connection proteins. That many of our cells do not just exist in isolation, that they are connected by their membranes. So our plasma membranes are connected to one another in many cases. That the cells, like a red blood cell that's just floating in the plasma of our blood is not connected to another cell, but the cells of our digestive system, they have to be connected together. So, whether a cell is connected to another cell depends on the kind of cell, the kind of organism, what that cell, what that organism is doing. So when you have connections, let's take a look at some of the possibilities that we might see in some cells. Desmosomes, they hold cells that are adjacent or next to one another together. This is important for cells that are stretched or compressed like the heart cells, they stretch, they compress, they stretch, they compress when your heart beats. So it's gonna be really important for blood not to just be leaking through those cells. A lot of our digestive system cells are gonna be stretched and compressed often. So you can see there's little tiny like sewing in between the two cells. Here's another example that you've got, it looks like quilting between the cells holds them together. Tight junctions, very similar. They're going to make cell membranes leak proof. You will often see that where you have desmosomes, you will also have tight junctions. It's another insurance policy that your cell doesn't rip open. So it's another kind of essentially sewing between the cells. And you can see it from the side here, or here you can see it looks like, again, quilting in the cells. 
And then gap junctions allow for cells to communicate with one another. Your liver does so many important things for so many systems that it's important for the liver cells to pass information. If it does a lot of things for a lot of systems and makes a lot of stuff and breaks down a lot of stuff, it's got to be able to communicate from cell to cell, what are we doing right now? Because we have so many functions, let's talk about what we're doing right now. What are we doing in regard to this molecule? Do we need to make something? Do we need to break something down? Same thing, heart cells. Because heart cells beat in unison, they have these junctions or they're like pores to be able to flush ions across the heart so that all the cells almost in complete unison are contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. So here you can see those pores or holes between cells. And then if we're talking about plant cells, these are called plasmodesmata. They are a little bit different because these cells have a cell wall. So when cells have a cell wall, they need a thicker kind of pore called a plasmodesmata. Here you can see that these are going to be a little bit more complex, a little bit bigger than when we're talking about animal junctions. One last question. The plasma membrane performs, performs all functions except for which one? So it's going to regulate the flow of materials in and out of the cell, it provides a barrier, facilitates communication with other cells, maintains concentration, concentration gradients. It does not facilitate the cell membrane, does not facilitate protein synthesis. Yeah, those are the, the ribosomes. The ribosomes, yes, correct, very good. The ribosomes facilitate protein synthesis, very good. All right, so that's number two. I don't have highlighted, but it is number two. All right, we will head to lab. We will finish up our lab.